The earth is not flat. We live on a spinning globe. It's amazing to me that I actually have to say those words in 2016. But there are a number of scientifically confused people that have convinced themselves and are trying to convince others that we live on a stationary flat plane. There are a number of reasons for this resurgence of a long-extinct belief system, including literal interpretations of the Bible, scientific illiteracy, cherry-picking and other errors in reasoning, and a general distrust of government leading to imagined conspiracy theories. I don't for a second think that NASA, along with every other public and private space enterprise, and every other scientifically literate person in the entire world are involved in a massive conspiracy to hide the truth from us. That's a claim that demands really strong evidence. But let's leave them out of it. I cannot prove to you that the images and videos from space are real, and you cannot prove that they are fake. But we don't need to believe them. We can prove the globe and the heliocentric model to ourselves without them just as generations of people did long before NASA or anyone else went to space. In a series of short videos, I would like to teach you how you can prove to yourself with your own eyes and experimentation that we live on a spinning globe. Several things that we can see with our own eyes clearly demonstrate that the Earth is a globe and cannot be adequately explained by the Flat Earth model no matter how you try to twist reality. These include the apparent movements of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, moon phases, lunar eclipses, time zones, and many others. But in this first video, I'm going to focus on just one thing, the horizon. The most important thing to understand is that the horizon is flat. That's right. From our vantage point, even from a high mountain or an airplane, the horizon is flat. Flat earthers, and also many globalists, for lack of a better term, seem to think that the horizon should look curved to us. That's flat wrong. And I think this is the single biggest reason there even is a flat earth community. The biggest source of confusion. You are expecting to see a curve where there is none to be seen you are looking for the wrong thing. To picture what I mean, look at this orange. If I take a thin slice of it, I get a round disc. The edges of it, where the knife cut through, is a flat circle. That is what you see when you look at the horizon, the edges of a circle. The edges don't curve side to side, they run straight across our view. And since we are always in the center of the circle, they don't curve down. When you can see the horizon in all directions, it is the same distance away in all directions. So when you spin around, it looks exactly like a straight line and comes back around to join itself. Think about that. If it were curved down, it would not come back around and join itself at the same level. Even from a high mountain or from an airliner, the horizon is flat. Because the Earth is so big, and we are so close to it. All we are ever going to see is a small, flat, round slice of the ball of the Earth. There's a handy website that will calculate the distance to the horizon for any viewing height, and it also tells you how much of an object will be hidden behind the horizon if it's past the horizon. The site is metabunk.org slash curve. Let's look at an example. This is the view from the J.P. Morgan Chase Tower, the tallest building in Houston. The observation deck is 879 feet above the flat Texas landscape. According to the Metabunk site calculation, the horizon is about 36 miles away. So this is what the horizon looks like on a map, a circle with a 36-mile radius. As we zoom out, you can see what a small part of the Earth this is, under 1% of the Earth's diameter of 7,918 miles. And when we show it edge on, you can really see that it is just a small, flat, round slice of the large Earth. But getting back to the orange, 
You might be thinking that the slice of the orange is not flat. It curves down in all directions from the center. Well, yes, that is true for the orange, and it's also true for the Earth. And you can clearly see that on the orange. But on the Earth, it is simply impossible to see, because the Earth is so tremendously big. If you are six feet tall, and you stand at the shore of the ocean, or on a flat desert plain, the horizon is about three miles away. And the change in vertical height of the surface is only one and a half feet, spread evenly over the entire three-mile distance. You just aren't going to be able to see that. It's way too subtle. As an illustration, this is a Google Earth picture of the New York City skyline from Caven Point, New Jersey, just over three miles away. The Earth does indeed curve down away from the viewer in this picture, but it is just about 1.5 feet spread over three miles, so it is just too slight to see. The Statue of Liberty is in the picture, and it's 305 feet tall, and only 1.2 miles away, and look how small it looks. But if the horizon is flat, how does it prove a round Earth, you might ask? It's what happens when objects are past the horizon that reveals the curve. Sailors, for many centuries, have noticed that ships sailing away from you in the distance disappear bottom first and sail last. If you live near a large body of water, you can easily see this for yourself with binoculars or a telescope. But here is a video you can watch of a cruise liner going over the horizon. See the link in the description for the full video. This only works on a curved Earth. The view of the ship is obviously going behind the curve. And you can always calculate exactly how far away this will happen, depending on how high you are up from the water. The higher up, the farther away the horizon. Flat Earthers try to explain this phenomenon away in a few ways. Some claim that the ships aren't actually hidden by the curve, they are just at the limits of our ability to see them, and if you zoom in, they come back into full view. But whenever they try to demonstrate this, they use a boat that is near the horizon, but not beyond it, like this one. Notice, he did not show a boat that was hidden at the bottom. This is just a blatantly wrong example to use. I don't know how they think this explains anything. The examples they use are always not beyond the horizon, but near it, or right at it. To show the effect, you have to show a boat partially obscured by the horizon, like this, not this. Some will show a boat in choppy seas and claim that the swells are causing the obscuring of the bottom of the boat. But again, that's a bad example to use. Do you think there are swells big enough to hide half of this cruise ship? Also, you will need a clear day and one without extreme cold. Cold air near the water can create a number of different mirage effects because the temperature differences actually bends the light. But you can usually tell when this is happening, and it only happens in certain conditions. Also, the sun and moon rising and setting beyond the horizon perfectly shows that the Earth is curved, and they are much easier to see than distant boats. They both emerge from or slide behind the horizon exactly as we expect on a globe, and not at all what we would see on a flat earth. Flat earthers claim that the sun and moon circle above the flat earth, and the rising and setting is due to them coming in and out of view due to perspective. As explained, and I use the term loosely, in this clip from flat earther P. Brain. Okay, here's a little, uh illustrator or a little cartoon from a website called timeanddate.com. It's really funny that they would have a perfect illustration of a sun rising and setting on a flat earth due to perspective. You'll notice that it rises from below the horizon and sets below the horizon. Now you might be saying, well, how is that possible? I can see now you're saying that it rises and lowers due to perspective, but how does it disappear below the horizon? Well, I got a theory about that. Because of the fact that all parallel lines and planes converge at your eye-level horizon, this is according to the perspective. I'm not making this up. If, in fact, and they do, they converge at your eye-level horizon visually, then it makes sense that after that point, they diverge, meaning they then separate. So the sun would continue on a downward track. 
as you can see from my illustration here, the lines would go to your horizon and then afterwards they would spread out and separate, kind of like a starburst. Two huge problems here. One is that he shows a sun in the animation that always stays the same size, which indeed is what we see in reality. But if it were disappearing due to perspective, it would be getting bigger as it rises and smaller as it sets. But in his animation, it does not. The edges of the circle of the sun would get farther apart and closer together, just as all the sight lines he drew in do. Why would everything get smaller as it moves away except the sun or moon? That's absurd. Here is what we actually see. The sun and moon slide behind the horizon and maintain their visual sides. That is not perspective. Perspective works both vertically and horizontally. Objects farther away appear smaller and closer together in both directions. If the sun and moon were just circling over the flat earth and getting too far away to see, then we would see them shrink and fade out of view as they set. But we don't. Flat earthers will show you videos where the sun appears to grow or shrink, but this is an illusion due to thick clouds. You can always see that there are clouds near the horizon when they try to show this. Normally, this illusion does not happen. The second way this so-called perspective matrix fails is even more ridiculous. The lines drawn in the illustration are lines of sight, and they correctly converge to the vanishing point, the point at which you can't see farther. But he claims that past the vanishing point, the lines diverge. What? What lines? It's a vanishing point. There are no lines of sight past a vanishing point. There is nothing to diverge. You can't have lines of sight past what you could see. And if it did work that way, we could see objects beyond the horizon and they would be upside down. Think about that. No, this is totally wrong. Another way to demonstrate the curve is with distant city skylines. A good example is the city of Toronto, viewed from across Lake Ontario. The city is dominated by the distinctive CN Tower, currently the third tallest tower in the world at 1,815 feet. There are many pictures online of the Toronto skyline, viewed from Niagara-on-the-Lake, New York, 30 miles away. With the Metabunk calculation, we see that 486 feet of the tower, or about 26% of it, should be hidden behind the curve of the Earth from that distance. And this is exactly what we see, as you can easily tell when compared to an image of the full tower at the same scale. Flat Earthers sometimes show cities in the distance that, according to them, should be below the horizon but are clearly visible, and claim this proves the flat Earth. This can be difficult to disprove, because you never really know where the picture was taken from. They may have gotten the distance wrong, or the height of the observation wrong, or the calculation wrong. One example they use is the Chicago skyline seen from 60 miles away across Lake Michigan. At a viewing height of 6 feet, we calculate that 2,166 feet should be below the horizon at 60 miles. So they are right that the entire city of Chicago should be completely hidden. And it is hidden nearly all the time, but sometimes it can be seen from that far away due to a type of atmospheric light refraction phenomenon called a superior mirage. A superior mirage is caused by colder air below warmer air, which bends the light around the curve of the Earth. This event sometimes makes the news for the very reason that it is a rare occurrence. Until I found this photo from Grand Mere State Park. This is from Joshua Nowicki. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skylight. You can tell that it's a mirage because there is lots of distortion. The Willis Tower on the left is clearly elongated. And also, there are videos of this same view that show the buildings dancing around, changing shape, and even disappearing.
Even though this is a mirage, the bottom parts of the buildings are clearly still obscured from view, just as we expect. If the earth was flat, you could see the buildings on any clear day, not just rarely when the conditions are right for refraction. Flat earthers use these rare events to try to prove the earth is flat, but that makes no sense. It's called cherry picking, a favorite trick of all types of science deniers. You don't get to pick the anomalies that seem to agree with your views and ignore the common observations that don't, and still call yourself an honest investigator. That is intellectually dishonest. As I have shown, the horizon is all we really need to know that we live on a sphere. But there are other observations you can make yourself that all perfectly fit the heliocentric globe model when you understand it, as I will explain in future videos. Thanks for watching. This is part two of a series called Proving the Earth is Not Flat. In this series, I intend to demonstrate how anyone can prove to themselves using simple observations and experiments, that the Earth is not flat. It is a spinning and moving sphere. In this part, we will look to the stars. But first, to understand the shape and movements of the Earth, we need to understand how it works within the context of the solar system and the distant stars that surround it. The nature of the Earth, solar system, and stars took many centuries to figure out. The Greek mathematician Pythagoras was the first to propose that the Earth was a sphere in the 6th century BCE, but it wasn't accepted by most of the world until the Middle Ages between the 5th and 15th centuries. So, flat earthers, you are only about 600 years behind the curve. Because we live on the surface of the Earth, we are limited to seeing it from our perspective. Or at least we were back then. So when our perspective is limited, scientists create conceptual models and test them against observations. If a model cannot explain all observations and experiments, you either modify the model until everything fits, or throw out the model and start over. The prevailing model in the Middle Ages was the geocentric model, with the spherical Earth at the center of everything, and the sun, moon, and stars revolving around us. And, to the casual observer, from our perspective, that is what it looks like. But, while the model explained many observations, it failed to adequately explain some of them. Most notably, the apparent retrograde motions of the planets. Copernicus solved that problem by realizing that the Sun is the center of the system, not the Earth. And the heliocentric model still works to this day to perfectly explain all observations, measurements, and experiments. Also, the ultimate test of any scientific model is its ability to predict future events. Using the heliocentric model, we can accurately predict lunar and solar eclipses, conjunctions, planetary alignments, and many other phenomena down to the minute or second. This is how real science works. No flat Earth model has ever been able to explain all astronomical observations, let alone make accurate predictions. I challenge any flat Earther to use your model to predict the next lunar eclipse. So let's see how our view of the stars fits with the heliocentric model, and compare it to the flat Earth model. In the heliocentric model, the Earth spins on its axis once per day. The axis is tilted about 23.5 degrees, and that tilt constantly points in the same direction as the Earth revolves around the Sun once per year. This tilt is the cause of our seasons, and the seasonal variation in the length of daylight. The stars around us are very far away, but all the stars we see without powerful telescopes are circling the Milky Way galaxy with us, in the same direction and the same speed so they are essentially stationary from our frame of reference. It is this backdrop of stationary stars we can look to to understand the shape and movements of the Earth, as I will explain. In the Northern Hemisphere, we look at the stars and we see star formations we all recognize, such as the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and Cassiopeia. But in the Southern Hemisphere, 
these constellations cannot be seen at all, and different star formations are seen, such as the Southern Cross and Centaurus. And some constellations near the celestial equator, such as Orion, can be seen in both hemispheres. This makes perfect sense for the spherical Earth. Northern observers are looking generally upward toward the North Pole, and southern observers are looking generally downward toward the South Pole and seeing different stars. The curvature of the Earth is what blocks the stars of the other hemisphere from view. To illustrate, these blue arrows represent the direction an observer in the north views the stars in the sky, and the red arrows are the direction of the stars viewable by an observer in the south. They intersect in the middle, but you can see how the shape of the Earth limits our view of the opposite hemisphere. In contrast, on the flat Earth model, the north is the center and the south is a ring around it. The stars would have to be arranged in a dome shape over the flat Earth. In this model, it makes no sense that people in the north cannot see the southern stars, and vice versa. And it is particularly absurd that people in the outer ring can all see the same southern stars, but not the northern stars at all. There should be nothing blocking their view of all the northern stars. Also, consider that on nights when the moon is visible, we all see the same moon running across the sky, everywhere on Earth, and we see the stars behind it. This works perfectly fine on the heliocentric model. But when you look north from the outer ring of the flat Earth model, there is no logical reason you would not see the northern stars behind the moon. The moon is supposedly close by and circling above near the equator. And you would be looking northward with the moon near the center of the sky. But somehow the northern stars can't be seen? This is an insurmountable failure of the flat Earth model. And it only gets worse for the flat Earth model. The nightly rotation of stars is perfectly explained by the Earth's rotation on its axis. Every night, we see the stars rise and set overhead. They move very slowly, but if you watch for half an hour or so, you will notice them change positions, moving from east to west. In the northern hemisphere, you will also notice the stars to the north rotate counterclockwise around a central point, called the celestial pole very near a star called Polaris. You can easily see this yourself. Look for the Big Dipper, and the end of the Dipper always points to Polaris, a relatively bright star. With patience, you can watch the Big Dipper and the other nearby stars rotate around Polaris each night. This phenomenon is a favorite subject of professional and amateur stargazers, and you can find many long exposure photographs and time lapses of it. In the southern hemisphere, when you look to the south, you also see stars rotate around a point. But they are different stars, and they rotate in the opposite direction, clockwise. There is a star named Sigma Octantis very near the southern celestial pole, but is not a very bright star, so it is difficult to see. This apparent spinning of the stars around a north and south axis is perfectly explained by the heliocentric globe model as the spherical Earth rotates on its axis and our view of the essentially stationary distant stars rotates. The distant stars to the north and south spin around a point because we are seeing them over the spinning axis of the Earth. Depending on how far north or south you are, some stars stay above the horizon all night long. These are called circumpolar stars, but they are completely different stars in the north and in the south. How would this work in the flat Earth model? Well, to put it simply, it couldn't. In any flat Earth model, the stars would have to be arranged in a semispherical dome over the flat circular Earth, and Polaris would have to be in the center, and that would seem to explain what we see in the north. But south of the equator, the outer concentric ring in the flat Earth model, now you have huge problems. When you look to the south in South America, in southern Africa or in Australia, you see the same clockwise spinning stars. Yet people in those three locations would be looking in three different directions when looking to the south. Yet somehow they see the same thing. Where could the southern celestial pole 
and the circumpolar stars be in this model? Are they in many places at once? No, it simply cannot work. Of course, not all three of these distant locations are all in nighttime at the same time, but two of them at a time are, and the celestial pole and circumpolar stars stay visible all night long and are always directly to the south. I know some of you are going to claim that it simply doesn't look like that in the south, and that all images of it are faked. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. You could go and see it for yourself, but I do recognize that it is not cheap or convenient to travel to the southern hemisphere if you live in the north, and I have never been there myself. But if you were to go, I am extremely confident you will see the southern constellations, such as the Southern Cross, and also you will see the stars rotating clockwise around the southern celestial pole. Why am I so sure? Independent confirmation. No scientific claim ever comes from a single observer or a single observation. Science demands that observations are independently confirmed. And in this day and age, you can easily get independent confirmation yourself by finding someone on social media that lives anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere and asking them what they see at night. Or find any number of independently produced videos of it on YouTube. Of course, people lie and videos can be faked. But if you pick people at random, there is no reason to think they are part of a conspiracy, especially if you don't tell them why you are asking. And the more independent neutral sources you can find, the less likely it is that they are all wrong or lying. If the stars in the South did not actually appear the way they teach it in all the schools of the world, a great many people would have noticed it, as anyone in the entire hemisphere can look at the stars. There is no way to hide them. But no one, outside of a few flat earthers, have ever said the stars don't look right in the south. Nearly the entire population of the southern hemisphere would have to be in on a conspiracy, or somehow deluded, if the stars didn't actually appear as people have been reporting for centuries. The Southern Cross is actually depicted on the national flags of five southern hemisphere countries. Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Papua New Guinea, and Samoa. I'm not asking you to believe me. Either go there yourself or find multiple independent sources to tell you or show you what they see in the sky. Another thing we notice in the real world is that the stars that are near the celestial equator change throughout the seasons. We can see Orion in the winter. In spring, we see the sickle of Leo the lion. In summer, Scorpius dominates the equatorial sky, and the fall brings the great square of Pegasus into view. This is explained by the Earth's orbit around the Sun. The night side of the Earth rotates around, and thus our nighttime view points outward to different stars. There is no valid explanation for this observation in the flat Earth model. And this brings up a subject that confuses some flat Earthers. They say if the Earth orbits around the Sun, why doesn't noon become midnight six months later? Why don't the day and night times reverse? The answer is that our system of measuring time already takes the orbit of the Earth around the Sun into consideration automatically. Noon is when the Sun is the highest in the sky, and the time from one noon to the next noon is divided into a 24-hour day. This is called a solar day. But because the Earth orbits around the Sun about one degree every day, the Earth actually has to rotate a little bit more than 360 degrees for the Sun to be directly overhead at the same place. A full 360 degree rotation in relation to the distant stars is actually a little bit shorter than 24 hours, about 23 hours and 56 minutes. This is called a sidereal day. So that's why noon doesn't become midnight six months later. And this orbit around the sun explains why the stars we see at night near the celestial equator change throughout the year. The night side of the Earth rotates around, revealing different stars. There is one more thing flat earthers complain about regarding our view of the stars that I want to address. They ask why does Polaris, and all the other stars as well, remain in the same place from our perspective year after year if the Earth is rotating on its axis and on a 23.5 degree tilt, 
and also revolving around the Sun, and also moving around the Milky Way galaxy. This is no problem at all when you understand it. The Earth's daily rotation on its axis accounts for the rotation we see in the sky and around the two celestial poles, as I've shown. And since Polaris is near the North Celestial Pole, it stays close to the same position. Also, as I already explained, all the stars we see with the naked eye, including Polaris, are revolving around the Milky Way with us, in the same direction and close to the same speed. So that will not cause the stars to change their relative position in our sky in the short term just like how other cars on a freeway moving with you seem to stand still. And one revolution around the Milky Way takes about 225 million years, so we are essentially moving in a straight line. With Earth's moving around the Sun, the Earth's axis stays pointed in the same direction in relation to the stars, and since Polaris is so tremendously far away, our view of it does not change noticeably. We're going to need some simple trigonometry to demonstrate this, but I'll use an online triangle calculator to make it easy. The latest estimate for the distance to Polaris is 323 light years. This is an unimaginable 1.8 quadrillion miles, or 1.8 thousand billion miles. Our trip around the sun is only about 186 million miles, which is a tiny fraction in comparison. So, if we form a triangle from Polaris to the Earth, and over to the location of the Earth six months later on the other side of the Sun, we can calculate the distance that Polaris will seem to move from our perspective. The change in its viewing angle. This is called its parallax. When we plug in the distances of all three sides of the triangle into this triangle calculator, we find that the angle we view Polaris only changes by, are you ready? 0 0.0000566 degrees. There is just no way you are going to notice that. This is why Polaris and all the other stars maintain their visual position year after year. They are just so tremendously far away. So we see that just looking up at the stars provides further confirmation that the Earth is a spinning and moving sphere. When you understand what you are seeing, and you understand how it fits with the heliocentric model. The heliocentric model is the correct model because it perfectly explains all observations, experiments, and measurements. Not because some government agency or secret society says so. Science works by observation, independent confirmation, experimentation, testing, and making accurate predictions never by authority. And science is really open to everyone. Go out and look at the stars yourself and test the models against what you see. No flat earth model can even come close to properly explaining what we see in the stars or any of the other observations I discuss in this series. That's why it was thrown out centuries ago. Thanks for watching. This is part three in the series, Proving the Earth is Not Flat. The goal of this series is to show you how you can prove to yourself, with your own observations and experiments, that the Earth is a sphere. Today we will look at the Moon. It is important to understand a number of facts about the Moon so that I can show you how our observations of it can demonstrate that the Earth is a sphere, and how it can only work within the heliocentric globe model and not in any flat earth model. The moon is a sphere that orbits the earth about once every 27 days. Some flat earthers will claim that the moon is a flat disk or just a light in the sky or some sort of projection or even a hologram. All of these are absurd and easily refuted by the evidence. The fact that there are many different explanations and again, I use the term loosely, for the moon within the flat earth community should tell you something. There is only one explanation in the heliocentric model, the right one. But how do we know the moon is a solid sphere? Because no matter where you are on the earth, when you look at the full moon, it is always circular. Only a sphere looks round from all vantage points. If it were a flat disk, a light, or projection, circling above the flat earth, 
just a few thousand miles up, it would appear to look elliptical as it moves away from us, like this, because our viewing angle would change. Also, as I pointed out in Part 1, it would shrink and disappear as it moved away, like this, if it were only due to perspective, as flat earthers claim. It never does this. It slides behind the horizon at the same shape and size as it was when it was overhead. Also, when you look closely at the moon with magnification, you can see that the circular craters appear increasingly elliptical as they approach the edges, and exactly in the right direction, due to the curvature of the moon's spherical surface. The moon's phases are caused by the light of the sun reflecting off the moon. As the moon revolves around the earth, we see it at different angles in relation to the sun's light. The moonlight takes on a series of shapes as it goes through its monthly cycle. You can see with a simple demonstration that any sphere lit from one side and viewed from different angles will take on these shapes. Also, it's important to remember that the sun is about 400 times farther away than the moon, so sometimes the lighted side doesn't look like it points directly to the sun, but you have to think three-dimensionally to see that it does. Some flat earthers think the phases of the moon are supposed to be caused by the earth's shadow, that is wrong. The shadow we normally see on the moon is just the moon's own shadow, the side that is shaded because it is away from the sun. This is very different from lunar eclipses, when the Earth's shadow is seen on the moon. More on that later. Some flat earthers will claim the moon gives off its own light, rather than reflecting the sun's light. This is simply impossible. What mechanism could possibly explain how a big rock gives off light? which just happens to move across the surface in a pattern corresponding to the direction of the sun. And when the moon is less than full, it is easy to see shadows in its craters and on the side of its mountains, proving that the light is external. The moon cannot be its own light source. It cannot work. It makes no sense and has no plausible mechanism. The evidence all shows that the moon is a big, reflecting, spherical rock. When we look at the moon from anywhere on Earth, we see the same face of it, with the same distinctive craters and large dark areas called mare. This is because the moon rotates at the same rate that it revolves around the Earth. It does this because the pull of the Earth's gravity caused a slight bulging of the moon, and gradually that slowed the moon down until its rotation rate, relative to the Earth, reached zero. This is called tidal locking, and it is not unique to our moon. It occurs in most of the large moons in our solar system as well, and also the planet Mercury. The moon is about 239,000 miles from Earth. In most diagrams of the Earth and moon, you will see them close together like this, but this is not nearly the correct scale. When drawn to scale, we see that the moon is way out in the distance, about 30 times the width of the Earth away. This is why we are able to see the same face of it from everywhere on Earth. At that distance, our angle of view is essentially the same from all locations on Earth. How do we know it's that far away? Well, there are a number of ways to determine the distance to the moon. One way is by measuring the moon's angle above the horizon simultaneously from two distant points on Earth, and then using simple trigonometry to calculate the height. When this is done, the distance to the moon is calculated to around 239,000 miles, and this closely matches other modern methods of measuring the distance, including radar and lasers, and also ancient methods, such as using lunar eclipse geometry. But since the method uses the horizon, the calculation works out quite differently if you assume the Earth is flat, because you then assume the horizon is the same in both locations, while on the curved Earth you need to compensate for the curve of the Earth between the two points. So, assuming a flat Earth puts the Moon much closer, and flat Earthers calculate the Moon is only about 3,000 miles away. So how can we tell who is right? Well, besides all the other evidence for the curved Earth, we know the moon cannot possibly be that close, 
due to the simple fact that everyone on Earth always sees the same face of the moon when it is visible in the sky. If it were only 3,000 miles away, that simply would not be possible. Let's look at an example on the Flat Earth map to demonstrate this. When the moon is visible, you can see it from Maine in North America and southern Argentina in South America at the same time since they are at the same longitude. They are each about 3,000 miles from the equator. So, if the moon is only 3,000 miles high above the equator on the flat earth, when viewed from the side, this forms a right triangle with the viewing angles to the moon being 45 degrees in each location. Anyone notice the problem? This means that in each location, a person would be viewing the moon at an angle that is about 90 degrees different from the other location. They simply could not possibly both see the same features on the same side of the moon, but of course, in reality, they do. Also, if the moon is full for the northern observer, it would be only about half full for the southern observer. But we know that the moon's phases are seen almost exactly the same everywhere on the Earth at the same time. The only way you could see the same side of the moon and the same phase everywhere on Earth is if it is far out in the distance so that all viewing angles are essentially the same. You can verify this yourself. Find someone in a different part of the world and ask them what phase the moon is in. They will always see the same phase that you see, or very close to it, on the same day. This is not possible with a close moon circling above a flat earth. Another way the moon reveals the shape of the earth is with lunar eclipses. This is when the earth's round shadow can be seen crossing the face of the moon. They can happen as often as once every six months and are visible everywhere on the night side of the earth when they occur. They don't happen every month for one simple reason. The moon's orbit around the earth is tilted about five degrees from the earth's orbit around the sun. When shown to proper scale, with the moon about 30 Earth diameters away, you can see how the orbital tilt of 5 degrees can cause the moon to pass below or above Earth's shadow. This animation shows the variation of the moon's position in relation to the Earth's shadow when it reaches full moon each month. Most months, it passes above or below the shadow. Only when the angle of the moon's orbit is aligned with Earth's orbit at full moon does a lunar eclipse occur. This is a great example of how Flat Earthers' objections to the globe are based on a misunderstanding of the facts. They often claim an eclipse should happen every month, but this is because they do not understand the scale of the Earth-Moon system and the 5-degree tilt of the Moon's orbit. They are not arguing against the actual facts. They are arguing against their own ideas of how they think it is supposed to work. This is called a straw man fallacy. When you get the facts right and understand all the relationships, scales, and concepts involved, you will see it really all does work. Your biggest problem is your misunderstanding of the model. My goal is to clear up as many of these misunderstandings as I can. When the orbit of the moon is aligned with the Earth at full moon, a full or partial lunar eclipse occurs, and we see the large circular shadow of the Earth pass over the moon. The Earth is about four times the size of the Moon, but its shadow on the Moon is a little less than that because the shadow is slightly cone-shaped. Since we know the distance to the Moon, we can calculate the size of the Earth from its shadow using simple geometry, which comes out to 7,917 miles in diameter, and this matches all other measurements. As the Moon is covered by the Earth's shadow, it begins to appear reddish, often called a blood moon. This occurs because of the reddish light of the Earth's atmosphere glowing on the darkened moon. It's red for the same reason sunsets are often red. Red light can pass through the atmosphere and not get scattered much, while light at the blue end of the spectrum is more easily scattered. So at sunrise and sunset, when the sunlight travels a long path through the atmosphere, the blue light has been mostly removed, leaving mostly red and yellow light remaining. 
the eclipsed moon is lit by a sunset that circles the globe from its perspective. This red color is further confirmation that the lunar eclipse is caused by the shadow of the Earth. I've seen some flat earthers claim that it is impossible to cast a red shadow. No, that's just wrong. The Earth doesn't really cast a red shadow on the moon per se. It blocks the most direct white light of the sun and shines a dim red light on the darkened surface. What is the flat earth model's explanation for lunar eclipses? They really don't have one. Some of them claim it is probably due to a semi-transparent disk passing in front of the sun and shading the moon, sometimes called the anti-moon or shadow object. But they have no observations of it outside of eclipses and no explanation for what it is, why it never casts shade on the earth or blocks the stars, what holds it up, or what makes it move. It's just a special pleading fallacy with zero evidence, an attempt to save their belief from contradictory evidence. Another serious problem with the flat earth model is that flat earthers never explain what force keeps the moon circling above the flat earth. There is no known force that can do this. Is it magic? Is it supposed to be attached to the dome or firmament? They never really say. But of course, that could not work because it moves at a different speed and in a different path than the stars and the sun and the planets. And also, it goes in front of the sun during solar eclipses. And also, the moon's orbit, like nearly all other orbits, is not perfectly circular, but slightly elliptical. So its distance from Earth varies, and we can see this because its apparent visual size varies by as much as 12%. What force in the flat Earth model can cause that? Does it go up and down? Does it shrink and grow? In reality, we know exactly what keeps the moon moving across our sky. It's called gravity. The moon orbits the Earth due to the pull of Earth's gravity. Many of you have said that gravity has never been proven, or even that it doesn't exist. It's hard for me to describe exactly how ridiculous that is. I am still astounded when I hear a flat earther say this. You are denying something that we all easily observe every day. There is no force or phenomenon that is more scientifically proven than gravity. You don't have to understand the physics of why it works to see that it does work and works the same everywhere in the universe. The same force that is holding you down right now and has for your entire life is the same force that causes all dropped or thrown objects to be pulled back down to the earth in a precisely predictable way and is the same force that holds the moon circling around the earth. This is how all orbits work. Smaller objects near bigger objects are pulled in by gravity. Some will crash right into the bigger object, and some will be going too fast and fly on by. But if they are going the right speed, they will be pulled into an elliptical path around the object. But that pull is counteracted by the centrifugal force outward caused by the revolutions around the object. And because there is virtually no friction in space, objects can remain in orbit indefinitely. A very easy way to observe orbits, other than our own moon, is to look at the moons of Jupiter through a telescope. I've done this many times, and it's a very amazing sight. If you don't have a telescope, find someone who does. There are astronomy clubs all over the world that will gladly let you have a look. The four biggest moons of Jupiter orbit the planet in a short amount of time, and you can actually see their movements within a single night. Their movements are exactly predicted by the force of gravity, the same force that keeps our moon in orbit around the Earth. You really cannot honestly say gravity has never been proven. This site alone proves it, and you can see it for yourself. When I started this series, I really didn't think I would have to explain that gravity exists and how we know it exists. It is something we all experience constantly, and we can easily test it ourselves. Unless you are completely delusional, you accept that things are pulled down. So, your only problem, really, is the direction of the pull. On a giant sphere with trillions of tons of mass, 
the direction of pull is toward the center of mass of the sphere. You take it for granted that things are always pulled down, but down is relative. Everywhere on Earth, down is toward the center. And no, gravity is not just density and buoyancy. Density and buoyancy are factors in how gravity works. But alone, they don't explain the consistent direction of the force. It's gravity that causes the force to have a specific direction, down toward the center of the Earth. Since we are talking about gravity, I want to address another issue that keeps coming up. Flat Earthers keep asking how gravity can hold everything to the Earth, including the oceans, if it is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. Well, there is a huge misconception here. Yes, it is true that the surface of the Earth does move at about 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, but that is irrelevant and misleading. The Earth only spins once per day. That is very slow. When you say 1,000 miles per hour, you make it seem like the Earth spins very fast like a top. And some flat earthers use words like rapidly, fast, and whizzing around when describing the spin. It doesn't whiz around. It barely moves. The speed of the stars moving overhead each night is the speed of the rotation, and you won't notice them move without watching for a long time. The earth spins once per day. That is twice as slow as the hour hand on your watch. It's only 15 degrees per hour. The only reason it is 1,000 miles per hour at the surface is because the Earth is so big. And a slow spin doesn't generate a lot of centrifugal force. Think of it this way. Hold a ball on a string and spin around fast. The ball is pulled outward by centrifugal force. Now, spin so slowly that it takes a full day to make one rotation. The ball will hang right down. Because the spin is so slow, there is almost no centrifugal force. That is the same for the Earth. The centrifugal force is so weak, it is only about 0.3% as strong as the pull of gravity. That is why we don't feel it, and why nothing, including the oceans, gets flung off into space. We can actually measure the tiny effect of centrifugal force, because objects weigh slightly less at the equator than they do at the poles. Every time you hear someone apply the Earth spins really fast at 1,000 miles per hour, think once per day. If I can get you to understand this simple concept, you will start to see why it's perfectly reasonable that we live on a spinning ball. All your objections are based on misconceptions, misunderstandings of physics, geometry, and scale, and flat-out denial of easily observable facts. Once again, I have shown you observations we can all make that show us the Earth must be a sphere. There is no other reasonable way to explain these facts. The flat Earth model cannot explain why we all see the same face of the moon and also the same phase of the moon from every spot on Earth on the same day. And it cannot explain why we have lunar eclipses that show us the Earth's round shadow in precisely the predicted size, position, and time. Flat Earthers struggle to explain these things with outlandish, implausible, and unsupported claims. Some of these would require inventing whole new laws of physics to explain them. But there is no need for that, because the heliocentric glow model explains all of it with easily observed and tested physical forces. Thanks for watching.